So, Dr. Park, you went through the systematic approach to analyzing the nurseries and deciding what steps to re re react to and what to do. Um, it's, we also need to take that outside. So to our contaminated sites and also to our sites that we are going to plant in the future. And have you any advice about what are going to be things that easily translate from what you've done already to the outside and what might be really different and we need to think about differently? Wow, that's a really good point, Cindy. Um, I, I don't know enough about what happens to those plants after they leave the nursery to probably answer that question. I mean, there are people in this room that could do a better job of answering that than I could. I, 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 there are a few things that I can immediately think of. That is, you never bring back containers that have been to the field back into your nursery once they've been contaminated. Same tools, footwear, you know, all of that. Um, and of course, going out, collecting seeds at the very, very beginning part of that whole chain, you'd want to use the same care not to either introduce contaminants to those, those areas where you're collecting the seeds or bring them back to your nursery if, if you don't know if, 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 let's say you're in a remorum infested area, you want to be collecting seeds and bringing them back to your nursery. But, ah, uh huh. Ah. Oh, really? Wow. That's really interesting. And so, and and someone mentioned the rice uh, material. I thought, wow, I didn't even know that was done. And I didn't know that plants were irrigated after. You know, I'm from Oregon. So. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, I think that you're bringing up some really good points, and, and I need to learn more about that. But I think it's a really good point. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can't project my voice. You mentioned that the dry heating doesn't, it hasn't been effective, and you showed demonstrations. So with this auger that they're talking about using, it's dry heat. Um, would you suggest that they add moisture to the soil or test the soil first before they use it or um so i don't you know i really don't know what would happen at a certain point that heat is so great that it's going to kill it i mean um so i oh did you Did everyone hear that? Okay. I was out there talking to the guys about the auger thing, and they say that really they would take that instrument, that piece of equipment out there when it's near field capacity so that steam is actually being formed. And a lot of the sites where we'd be using this, which are the shadier riparian sites, are going to have a higher natural soil moisture because they're on creek banks typically. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're already assuming that we're going to have higher levels of moisture. And then again, in other areas where it might be drier and hotter chaparral, then yeah, we would definitely make sure the soil is moist enough to be able to conduct the heat at a high enough temperature. Uh, okay. For the solarization, um, getting it to field capacity, do you uh, do any irrigation after you cover it? You don't need to add any water after it's covered because you're preventing any evaporation. Uh, I mean, there's a very gradual drainage, but it, it really lasts, it lasts for, for several weeks, and so um, you don't need to do that. But, but we use overhead or drip or soaker hoses or something to get it wet first. Okay. Um, I have been watching your work in the um, uh, Oregon Grower Certification Program, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that. I have three questions about that. Number one, what did it take to get that program going? Number two, what do growers have to do to be a part of it? And number three, um, how much interest has there been 
from plant purchasers in purchase, you know, what benefit has it been to growers? Okay, so you're referring to the GAPE program as grower assisted inspection program. And um, I'm not directly involved with that program through, that's run by the Oregon Department of Agriculture, but I uh, definitely worked with them when they were beginning that. And so they have to adhere to guidelines, and those guidelines have been evolving. Uh, initially, did not require water disinfestation treatment, for example. They were getting lots of contaminated plants. They changed that. Um, so it's kind of an adaptive kind of program. Um, I think there are right now under 20 growers that are participating in that. Um, for a while, there was a huge advantage to being a member of the GAPE program. When Remorum um, was perceived to be a, a very a huge issue, uh, APHIS is no longer in requiring the level of inspections that they used to. They're allowing um, distribution of plants interstate, and they're really only worried about the plants that are leaving the state. So uh, I don't think that out-of-state buyers in particular are, are really tuned in to the, to the hazards of remorum, and therefore that certificate, certificate program is not as valuable as it once was. Okay, so we're going to be moving into this um, less, this, this is not me presenting information. I'm just going to help moderate a discussion. So feel free to wiggle your chairs around. This is a way for us all to kind of have a discussion. Um, Elisa Shore is going to help uh, take some notes and uh, Diana Benner is going to help run the microphone. And my job is just to kind of um, set the stage for some different topics that we'd like to hear from you on. So we asked you to write down some questions, and um, we're not going to answer all the questions. <laughs> the questions were to give us a clue as to some general themes that were coming up from the group that we could base the discussion around. So if you, if you had a specific question in there, I encourage you to find one of the speakers at the end and, and ask your question directly, because there were some really good questions in there that we're not going to get into specifics about. We wanted to set the stage, though, in talking a little bit about why the working group formed in the first place, which was that a lot of these topics have been out there and people have been interested in trying to address them individually for some time. And the mission and purpose of the work group was to provide some consistency and coherence around that. So we didn't have a lot of different um, kinds of standards and um, trying to make it easier for everybody. So with that in mind, we wanted to ask some general questions to form, um, to help us think about what we still need to know more about and how we can move forward. So one of the ideas is um, coming up with a decision-making tool for people both in nurseries and in restoration areas to help prioritize how you spend your resources. We heard from Tyler, you know, and other people that there's all these things out there. We heard from other people about how the solarization from Mia and Janelle, it's so expensive. How do you make a decision about what you do? So that clear? We need, we, I'd love to get some feedback from the group about what are the priorities you have for making decisions when you're managing land, when you're buying plants, when you're planning from every aspect of of the restoration process so that there's some kind of parameters that we as a group can work um, into making this like a rubric of, of following um, decisions. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I think for us, it's starting with understanding low risk and high risk areas. Um, you know, I hear, I've heard a lot of discussion about you know, prevention of disease versus presence. And I find myself asking a question of, are we managing for a presence absence? Are we managing for a disease? What, what are we really managing for? Um, so that's kind of my first starting place. And then also when you sort of, because what you might be managing for might be different, right? In your high risk areas versus your low risk areas and, you know, helping understand what the thresholds are. Um, 
I, I work for SoCal Edison and we run some very large restoration projects and so um, certainly some of this stuff makes sense on a large, hi Susan. <laughs> um, large scale, some of it a little bit less practicable. Um, so just kind of understanding what those thresholds are would be really helpful. And can you just introduce yourself so we know kind of the context? Of what yeah, you're sorry, I'm, I'm Jenny McGee. Um, I'm the restoration lead biologist over at Southern California Edison. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my primary project is the Tehachapi Renewable, Great. which is very, very large and under restoration. Thank yeah. you. Anybody else want to bounce off of what Jenny just provided in terms of kind of ideas of risk, high risk, low risk areas, um, size, the scale of the projects you're working on? When would you make a decision about trying to do a mediation? When would you not? Matthew, back there. Hello. Um, my name's Matt Burtkin. I work for San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, and I'm part of their budding habitats team. Um, and we work on the Don Edwards Wildlife Refuge in the South Bay. And uh, I think bouncing off of the risk assessment of a site, it would be cool to have um, like, a, like species that you are either like trying to like propagate in a restoration area and having like a, here's a list of species, here's a list of the Phytophthora that would like pose like the most risk or like having like a per plant species in your habitat structure like risk, like how susceptible your plant palette would be in a site, I guess. Something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just chime in a little bit because there's a lot of land managers in here, and I'm just wondering if people might want to chime in. Like, what would be a low risk site, in your opinion? I'm just thinking drier sites, um, as opposed to a lot of the sites that we manage with the water district, which are almost all riparian. So the absence of water is the absence of. Ooh, and who are you with again? I'm with the Water District, John okay. Chapman. I'd say a few bay trees. Uh, and one of the uh, decisions we're struggling with in our open space, which is largely riparian, is whether or not to remove uh, bays. So Michelle uh, Hammond, East Bay Regional Park District. <laughs> I think one of the biggest things we're fighting right now is in Chaparral, in a really dry site. Um, we're pretty sure we might have a Phytophthora infection. So I don't know that dry sites are, and in fact, I think we saw on Ted's slide, dry sites aren't necessarily going to be low risk. So, but right now we've actually contracted with Ted um, to help us figure that out. So I'll know more hopefully in less than a year. Just to follow up on both of these comments, I think from water district operations perspective, um, John speaking of low uh, dry sites in the sense that there's less potential to transfer pathogens on equipment or on shoes or on tools when you're not in a muddy environment, you're not necessarily picking up as much soil and spreading it to a new area. So from that perspective, a dry site has a lower potential risk of a secondary transmission. But um, in the comment right after that, you know, in chaparral systems, we definitely on our projects do see a high risk of a Phytophthora infection when we install nursery container stock. So I think making a distinction between primary and secondary sources of contamination gets at both these comments in how things are spread and then what the level of risk is. I'm coming from it from, oh, um, my name's Mark Fogel. I, uh, uh, I'm in a co consultant with the SFPUC, I'm working on one of their uh, large restoration projects uh, in the Sonoma Valley. Um, just coming at thinking about risk from the other end, uh, the degree of mature vegetation at the site should be considered because you're putting that somewhat at risk. And um, 
you know, if you do have mature vegetation on site, you do also have probably a greater potential of using natural recruitment to um, uh, take part in the restoration pro process. So I just thought I'd add that in. My name is Bria. I work with the um, Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. We're doing a, a pretty large-scale tidal wetland restoration project with sediment addition, and we just got a huge... We're, and these big projects take many years, and um, so we got these dredge soils from the Pajaro River. They're, they haven't been tested, and I, we were growing, you know, thousands and thousands of plants to put into this, and so this, you know, like the decision-making... When something is in process, you know, these multi-year large-scale restoration process, projects that um, you've got to answer to regulators and this, the prioritization, we're, I'm, I'm trying to convince my team, you know, to test the soils. I don't, I don't know where to go with it. I mean, so I, I need, I guess I need, we need this um, because I still feel like with, um, in it, not everybody's at the table, I guess. And so we, what's the, what is your decision-making process? Um, I guess it's more of a comment. Thing. Allison Forrest, so I'm with Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And just as a follow-on to what you were saying, um, you know, Elisa is the nursery manager for our nurseries, and so we are getting really good, clean plants, but we have all these projects that are moving soil all around our parks and importing soil, and we have done some soil testing, and you know, you're not supposed to be able to get phytophthora from soil. We get, we get positives. And so figuring out how to manage that and how, you know, what risk is acceptable, because you can't shut down everyone's operations, is a big challenge for us. So I think anything where we're importing, importing anything is considered high risk. Importing soil, mulch, you know, straw, all that stuff I mentioned before. And then as far as like the low risk sites, what I would consider low risk would be we have a remote grassland, there's no public access, no, you know, nobody's really back there, it's, it's far. We're doing only weed control and seed addition. And I think in those kind of sites, the chances of us introducing something is pretty low. Actually, uh, that's what I was going to say, too, actually. So that is a great comment um, for decision making was like, are you going to do container planting or seeding, like hydro seeding or terrace seeding is your main like propagation at like a restoration site? So Mia, in those circumstances you're describing, if you were going to implement some BMPs for, you know, your seeds and your contractors and all those kind of things, I mean, SFPUC is doing sort of top tier P BMPs everywhere, right? <laughs> trying, trying. I was wondering if the BMPs are also being um, carried over into the restoration activities, so the actual outplanning, the people that are carrying out the restoration, you know, are they sanitizing their tools? Are they sanitizing their shoes? Are they sanitizing their vehicles? Just, just wondering if, if that's part of this process. Maybe I'll ask Janelle or Cindy from our restoration committee to chime in on that. <laughs> So at the Cal Fidos website, we have best management practices just for that. So people should be following them. Now what I can say at our agency, and again, I'm Cindy with the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, we actually put a freeze on any nursery plants and any planting for two years just to get ahead of the game and start figuring that out. 
So this fall is going to be the first time we're going to be planting. We're now getting excellent clean plants for the nursery, from the nursery. So now we have to responsibly take those clean plants. What was it that Jennifer said? We're even saying arrive clean, leave clean. So now, but we have to be careful when we're out on the site. And we're not always sure if the sites themselves are entirely clean. So we're taking those BMPs off of the Cal Fido's website and we're looking at it in terms of how we usually do our volunteer planting, how we usually work with a contractor, and we're trying to interpret them on the ground. And there's some things that seem pretty easy. Cleaning the tools is actually fairly easy. But some of these other things about making sure all the trucks that come in are clean and um, catching the miscellaneous importation of mulch and compost or special soil for the bottom of the... Um, the bioswales, where, where the biologists aren't always on the site, so we're not catching all of these. So it's just kind of a warning for you. Um, it, I think it's a, it's a big learning curve, and just keep on going back to those BMPs and educating within your organization, because more people than just you are making those decisions and arrive clean and leave clean. Yeah, that's something that we've struggled with here at the Water District, too, because we have a lot of crews that are out working every day in a wide variety of areas across the county. And sometimes they're responding very quickly to new areas, and it's, it's tough. And we try education. We try um, looking. Every, every job site is different, and there might be different ways of achieving the ultimate goal, which is to hopefully not spread a lot of contaminated soil around. So... It did, some projects we've been able to um, dedicate equipment to a job so it's washed before it comes on site. And then if it stays on that job, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be washed continuously every day or every time they move two feet to the right or to the left. Um, we've also worked with our contracting staff and our in-house staff directly, depending on the project. Um, one of our dam projects down in South County, it was an extended work period of I think it was like a six month job and they had a construction trailer on site and so what they decided worked best for them was to have their work boots dedicated to that job so at the end of every work day they would just leave their boots in the work trailer and then when they came back to work the next day they would change into those shoes and then they would go out onto the site so I think there are ways that you can minimize the amount of disturbance or the new tasks that people have to think about when they go into the field. But also, even just having our biologists, when, you know, when they're out doing surveys to remember, it's, it is really just a 15 seconds to spray the bottom of your shoes and make sure they're clean. So sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. Every situation is different. We also look at risk factors of various sites, sites where we have endangered species, sensitive habitats, really wet sites. Those are the ones that we're more concerned, more concerned about. Typically those sites are not on the valley floor where we already have a high level of disturbance with you know, homeless people, joggers, hikers, the public. So that's one level of sort of differentiation for various sites. And then contaminated sites too. We don't want to spread those into new areas. So trying to figure out like you know downtown Guadalupe, the Guad River runs right outside our building here, but it runs all the way down to the bay. And certain sections of that we found, I think, was it 14 species of phyt Phytophthora in Reach 6? So, one site. And that included Phytophthora tentaculata on that site. Or was it the next? <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do in that kind of site? We had, a, we had a repair project there. We worked with our maintenance crews. We said, here's the issue. We, we don't want to spread this into new areas if we can help it. You know, how can we get this job done and still achieve this goal? And so they came up with a, a pretty cool idea. They said, all right, well, we got to go across the channel to get to the bank repair, but why don't we put down... I can't remember if it was a layer of visqueen or something across the channel 
so that when the trucks are coming back and forth, they're not actually moving on the soil and on the ground. They're moving on a, a barrier that contains the spread from one end of the site to the other. So I think you really have to work, work very closely with people who are in the field, hear their concerns, and then try and strategize, and every situation might be a different solution. Um, to add to that, so I, um, Tim Buonacorsi of the Recon Environmental, we do a lot of habitat restorations for a huge range of government agencies, state, federal, and solar transmission lines. And I bring that up because, so we have BMPs that our crew does, and they're almost never written into the specs and the scopes of the projects. And so a lot of people here are, work for agencies or land stewards or conservancies in different places. And so, but that doesn't mean everyone, like it was mentioned before, not everyone is uh, privy to this stuff. And it needs to be written at a higher level and made known. It seems like noxious and invasive species have gotten to that level for the most part in planning. And um, so I, I feel like this needs to really get spread around so that all the contractors that work on these type of projects have their a set set of guidelines instead of their own. Oh, can I tag team off of that? Um, so we are in a very similar situation as many of you are. We have 120,000 acres, 65 parks. Each of one, each of those do kind of their own thing. They all have their own planting thing. They've got you know lots of um, interface plantings between the parking lot and the wildlands. We have just a million ways to introduce. Uh, pathogens and weeds and working on the BMPs issue is a difficult one because not only do we have to word it and structure it in a way that works for park staff, contractors, and then that needs to fit within some sort of cultural shift for all of us so there has to be some sort of buy-in. So I, I just want to say yes we need to have the detailed BMPs and then we also need to put it into a pictogram or something that's easy to follow, not a flow chart. I hate those. Um, and, you know, it, it, perhaps part of the working group can have that um, as a communication of these ideas. And um, when I consider training park staff about these things, I always have to put it into the context of giving them something they can do about it, rather than saying, because I could say, I could say it till I'm blue in the face, you can't plant anything anymore until we figure out what's going on. But they're still going to do it because I can't control them. And nobody gave me the authority to anyway, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> so I've got to give them something they can do. What are those rather than best management practices, best management actions? We've already stated a few of those. Seed more, right? Um, contract grow with somebody who will follow those phytosanitary practices. Consider, um, you know, I think, I can't help but think that some of what we're experiencing is because we've lost that really diverse mosaic of landscape where we have grassland, chaparral, and uh, woody species and, and oak bay woodlands. Now we, everything's become, gone, going through the succession and becoming more uh, woody, more um, chaparral. And now things can move more quickly through those. And so my, from my perspective, teaching park staff is to look at that heterogeneity of landscape. How can you promote that? Where do you have chaparral that's, that's encroaching in your grassland? Promote that diversity of landscape. Um, where's the disturbance regime? How can, you f how can you fulfill that in a way that doesn't spread pathogens or weeds? <laughs> Anywho, um, I'd love to talk more about that <laughs> later. Which park? East Bay Regional Park District, so 65 parks. Uh, on the same line, as far as getting people to buy in, like as far as some of the frustrations with our field staff with the Water District that have come out of this, it's like there's so many inputs and other factors that are beyond our control, which is um, similar to what you were just saying. We have something called a storm drain system here, which are a bunch of little creeks that drain the neighborhood and empty into our real creeks. Pretty tough way to manage uh, water molds if you have all this uh, polluted water coming from Walgreens, or not Walgreens, but uh, uh, Walmart nursery plantings draining out of someone's yard and into the storm drain system. We also share our maintenance roads with a lot of different agencies, including PG&E and, and you know, a variety of people, and so we can do everything right 
and you know one well-intentioned uh, Walmart Christmas tree planting on our levee, and we're we're toast. So I'm starting to feel like this is therapy. <laughs> <laughs> not alone. Oh God, I'm not alone. Um, so yes, we have layers, right? We have um, projects that are occurring on lands that have been involved in various historical uses, whether it's grazing, whether it's conservation in some cases for recreation, whether it's parks. We've got these huge right-of-ways. Then we have a major construction project. And we do things like bring in dirt for safety. We have to do cut and fill. We have to bring build roads sometimes. And then, yes, I mean, we have been very <clears throat> clean, um, largely because of the non-native species. Um, you know, measures that have been put in place for washing, washing tools, washing vehicles, um, both during construction and especially during restoration. Um, but given the many, many layers of all these different areas, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around, okay, now, now we're going to stop and change everything and it's going to make a difference because historically there's all these inputs that you have no other control over. Um, and I think that that's what we're struggling with. We did contract grow. We've, we've grown from seed. Um, you know, we've done a lot of things. But, but separating, I think, what you have control over and, and what you, you don't have control over, um, trying to go back to the, the topic of decision making, um, I, I think that that does play into risk because, again, we share right away with Caltrans, um, a lot of different folks, even um, other utilities. So... I just want to make a couple of comments relative to some of these things that have come on. Um, everybody's probably heard of the wanna cry um, thing. Okay, so years back when the internet was coming online, you could do all sorts of things and not have to worry about it. And as more and more people got into finding ways to hack the system and make money and do other sorts of things, we're no longer operating under the same systems we were earlier. And so, we're not going back to those either. So we have kind of a similar situation when we're talking about invasive pathogens like Phytophthoras. If we were unaware of it before and just spreading these around, that's one thing. But once you become aware and realize that we're moving a lot of Phytophthoras into these wildlands, we have to operate under different situations. It's not really, you're not really back in Kansas anymore. You're, you're in a new situation. And so, even with the, the last comment there, the idea that there's historical disturbances, there may well be. But if we have 50 or 60 Phytophthora species circulating in nursery stock, um, and moving any new Phytophthora into a, another site is always a bad idea, no matter what's already there. So we have to understand that there are several risks we can control, there are risks that we can't control. But definitely, if we don't control the risks we can, like starting with clean material, we're going to end up with a bad outcome. When we're looking at managing the risks of, of pre-existing situations, that takes some analysis because not every situation that you think um, is going to be contaminated necessarily will be because there's these probabilistic things that are going on. Not every bit of, every crumb of dirt is, is, is infested. And even if it is, not every one will result in infestation. So there's a number of different levels that you have to kind of consider in this, and there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all prescription on this. It's going to take a, it's going to be a thought process, but it should be integrated into all the other planning processes that go on with this. And one other th thing that came up along earlier is the idea that, you know, some of these things are easier uh, to do, some things are harder. There are risks that, for instance, moving soil is a risk, but it's a temporally variable risk. If I'm driving down a dirt road in the summer, my risk of moving Phytophthora in the dry site is near zero. If I'm down that same road in the winter and there's potholes full of mud and there's things like that, my risk of, of moving soil that could be infested is much greater. So when you have advanced planning available, you can look to to minimize your, your burden of, of working on these sites by understanding where you can, you can reduce these risks simply by operating under conditions where transmission is much, much reduced. 
So I think there's a wide variety of ways, some of them very simple, some of them not always avail up operable. If you're in the middle of the winter trying to fix a breach in a, in a, a levee or something like that, um, you're not going to be able to wait, wait till it's dry. So you're going to have to deal with different situations. But if you're making plans in advance to do fall planting somewhere, um, instead of spring planting, then you have the option of potentially working on, on a much lower risk situation. So I think there are ways to, to, to simplify this, but it really requires an understanding of, of the epidemiology of these, these organisms. And a lot of this information is known. It's just a matter of formulating in a way that you understand what, where those processes are and whether we use flow charts, we use an expert system, or we come up with some other sort of way to deliver the information. Um, that's what we're trying to do through the working group to, to get it out to people who are going to be using it. Okay, I'm gonna, I was hoping for an elegant segue into the second topic, but I'm just going to jump in. So thank you for all of those notes on decision making, and we're going to use them as we go forward. One of the other topics that came up um, is a, a kind of an idea about uh, where people are feeling, and this may be really like a feeling kind of response, about the idea of regulation. Um, we heard from Tyler that regulations now are based on species, and we also heard from Tyler that that's a really complicated concept. So, and there's been lots of conversations about, well, I want to know exactly what, um, what species I'm dealing with, which host plants, this and that, and that's fraught also. Um, so there's been maybe this idea of clean systems and how we move towards a more clean system approach. Maybe we would certify a clean system. There's also talk about maybe regulating, um, legislating different aspects of the restoration process to help with this kind of idea of keeping sites clean. And uh, there are pros and cons, and uh, people have lots of different opinions. So I'm wondering how people are feeling about the idea of increasing regulation on these pathogens, increasing some kind of oversight about how restoration occurs, um, just kind of getting out there where people are at with different concerns they may have or real uh, passions they feel pro or con. Great topic. I saw on the agenda for the next bit, the working group, something about legislation. Uh, would this be a time for someone to kind of give us an overview of what that is in relation to... You can stay for the working group meeting. How about that? <laughs> well, I'm just wondering if it's relevant to the topic that you just brought up. It, yes, yeah, so there is pending... There's something in process right now, State Bill 287, that is aiming to regulate restoration um, in terms of uh, using clean plants and other aspects of clean practices. That's, as, that's like the gross overview. Hi, I'm Jean. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So I'm in timber conservation. And um, just as far as the regulatory process goes, the forest practice rules require any time there's SOD in the forest that we're working on that it stays there. It doesn't leave. They have to clean the trucks before they leave the landscape. Um, one concern that I have is that this guy was talking about the importance of having a dry road <laughs> and uh, they need to have dust abatement for all the skid trails um, so that the rare and endangered plants are protected and that our creeks are protected with the amphibian species and, and all of our important salmonid species. So they're hauling in water uh, in the drought years, we've started severely restricting them from drafting water from the stream beds. Um, and so where are they getting this water from? Are they bringing in disease and putting it on the roads? That's a concern that I have. And another one, when they're done harvesting and there are, there's um, open soil, at least now we're getting only native seed put in instead of invasive Italian rye, big fight about that one. And, uh, but we're also requesting uh, sterile straw. And I heard something earlier about sterile is not good. So that's a question I have for a regulatory process. Hi, uh, my name's Kevin Schwartz. I'm with the Army Corps 
of engineers. Um, actually, my, uh, my question has nothing to do with Army Corps regulation. Um, but, um, and it's not a question, but it, the Santa Clara is dealing with all these, you know, 800 miles that are all bordered by neighbors who are buying plants from nurseries. So we can regulate um, restoration, but if we're not regulating um, all of the surrounding areas, then we're not we're not going to get very far because all of these are con particularly in Santa Clara. They're connected, and that's a huge issue that they're they're dealing with. One one thing um, the last um, uh, woman was talking about um, it, as far as photophthora and things that can be done. It's similar, very. Um, someone was mentioning too about how we have all these BMPs that have been set up for invasives. Um, <clears throat> that something similar could be set up for uh, in regulation for if I top throw. Like when I, I was in uh, working in Yosemite, they've had such good control over invasives coming into Yosemite, partly because there are limited access points mm -hmm. and because of the elevation gradient. But um, any time there was a fire. Uh, crews coming through, or if we had um, any kind of construction projects, every single vehicle had to be inspected. There was a process. If they weren't, they could be in violation. They could ha get fines. Um, and we could actually track. We knew we'd see, might see some invasives in, in one area. And we knew that it, it maybe had come from the dog fire when there was a fire crew that went out there and probably didn't get their um, trucks inspected. And we do have things, even though there's, you know, uh, hesitation, particularly, well, these types of pesticides are different than some of the very safe herbicides that we would use, but you can't maybe be able to use those on trucks and other things that are going into these areas to, to do that. So um, I will be staying for the working group thing later to because I'm interested to hear about these new regulations. But I think it's really important that they, those also pertain and, will be more difficult to try to enforce on um, the commercial. Back, yeah. Uh, Ramona Arechiga, San Mateo County Parks Department. Um, I guess the question or, or the comment that I have is with, with the idea of increased regulation, uh, I come from a pretty small organization. Uh, we have two natural resource staff. so. With increased regulation, especially if the agencies aren't collaborating on how those regulations might be implemented in the field, it gets increasingly challenging for small organizations to be able to negotiate the varying levels of, of regulation. So I would like us to be mindful as we move forward in how we can help um, converse with the agencies to make these regulations actionable on the ground for good projects. Um, my name is Leah Jambastiani. I work for Point Blue Conservation Science, and um, I'm concerned about regulation, um, not just for our native plant nurseries that are designed for restoration, but also for other horticultural nurseries, because I know that there is a significant amount of crossover that happens when people are in search of plants, including in Sonoma County, uh, government uh, entities, such as the count, different county agencies have gone to non-restoration based native plant nurseries in search of uh, plants, plant sources. And so um, while it's nice that we're um, moving forward to regulate and get best management practices in all of our restoration based nurseries, there are a lot of nurseries that do cross over in that realm. Yeah, to expand a little bit on your comment there. Um, well, Matt Quinn with HT Harving Associates, restoration ecologist. We are seeing too that this opens up the regulation question a bit. And <clears throat> when you're not talking about pure restoration, you're talking about mitigation, mm -hmm. and you have success criteria to be met that the different agencies are stipulating. 
Well, opening that conversation more with the agencies to show maybe you don't have as strict of regulations on the nursery practices, but you're writing into your specifications that a contractor's qualifications have to meet a number of things. You have best management practices written into it. Some of the restoration techniques that are now being considered to control for Phytophthora expand the amount of time necessary to meet what are typically written into permit documents for success criteria. So the regulatory agencies coming to the table with an open mind toward, okay, well maybe in five years we're not gonna have 75% cover along this riparian corridor. However, we're doing all these upfront measures to ensure we're not a vector for bringing in not only Phytophthora but other pathogens. So we back off on that and through these ongoing management practices, you're showing the efforts being put in and of course you're gonna have some degree of performance criteria associated with it, but not as extreme as they are now. I think, it, I'll just chime in that in our working group meeting too, I think we're gonna talk about a white paper that we've drafted for, to talk with regulators specifically about that. Regarding um, restoration and commercial non-restoration nurseries and the working group or just the industry's desire to what I would call what will probably end up be influencing them to better practices. You should look at what Plant Right has done um, and seen their successes and failures and learn from that because they've had some of both. Hey, um, I think I would be very much in support of regulation um, in, in coordination directed to work with the nurseries, um, both ornamental and, and um, you know, restoration or native plant. I, I think that's really, I mean, from what I'm hearing and what I've been learning, and I, I feel like I've had a crash course, but I, I, it sounds like that's really the source. That, that sounds like that's really where things are starting. And I am hearing a lot about other different sources of in, um, in introduction. And I think uh, Ted made a very good point. I mean, once you're aware, you have a responsibility to, to take action. Um, I, I find that BMPs um, during restoration are, are pretty palatable. Um, regulations that push onto restoration sponsors that say you can't have Phytophthora in your plants I, I don't know how actionable that is. I, I don't know how feasible, because I don't know that, I mean, just f from a utility perspective, we don't have the resources or uh, awareness or, an, uh, you know, expertise um, to really, or even the mission to go out and change the way nurseries are operating, and we can have the scrutiny of nurseries, and I certainly want a list by the end of the day, <laughs> nurseries, but... Um, you know, it sounds like this is really a lot of it is coming into the nursery industry. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, we've worked really closely with CDFA, and they've just been wonderful. And it, they have some regulations in place. Um, so I don't know, if, Suzanne, I'll <laughs> put you on the spot. But I, I, I think that that, to me, it seems like it would be a bigger positive impact um, for a greater, for a greater um, benefit to controlling the spread and introduction through through nursery plants in any case. And then I think is, there's also the other side of it where um, restoration sponsors, whoever your restoration project is for, or whatever it's for, should incorporate BMPs. Hi, um, my name is Nikki Hansen and I'm from Grassroots Ecology, a native plant nursery. And um, hearing your comment just then, made me realize that as a nursery person, um, I guess one of my big feelings about regulation is just, um, it's a tricky thing. Like I am completely for regulation of the nurseries, but it comes as like a two-edged sword kind of, where if you raise the bar to a high extent for the nurseries, which is what we're all doing, you also have to really change the expectation on the buy, plant buyer's side um, and drast or uh, proportionally like increase the cost and also change the expectations, kind of hitting on what Matt said. Um, 
from H. E. Harvey, uh, basically you have to change sort of those um, those markers of success or um, how much you're willing to spend per plant and that kind of thing. So it, that was my like gut reaction to hearing that, of, like, oh yeah, that's true. I'm completely working heart and soul to change our nursery, but at the same time, we need the other support on the other side of things too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll try to keep it brief, but as a regulator, um, we are working with Santa Clara and do realize that they're working really hard to try to find solutions. And so for things like temporal losses, we're not, uh, and where they haven't met success criteria. And so we're understanding that. And, I, and, and there are other folks in here who work with me in terms of the regulation, and we do realize that. So it's not just... Um, it isn't just on one side. We're, so there are people who are ecologists, biologists on the regulatory side who understand um, having it built in. It's the, the, the pot, the, a lot of the issue is, though, that we're coming up now is that um, the plans were written before us or bef a, a while ago, and so we're dealing with these are already written. But there are, in most of the language you read, that there is flexibility. You know, you can really... Most regulators will can tell the difference between a, an applicant or a client who's really trying versus someone who's clearly not. So, and I'm sure that anyone who's in consulting has seen that as well. Um, another thought on regulation, or my feeling on it is. Um, you put it out there, let's say it's just for nurseries in California. It doesn't matter who you're growing for or whatever. Um, and then they do the BMPs or whatever is in the legislation. Um, what's the follow-up on that? Um, I feel like it's going to be um, difficult to get qualified like people to go out and check nurseries, I guess, or the follow-up. Because from what Tyler was talking about and all the new findings and what's a real species and it all seems very confusing. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, in fact, I think right on that note, you know, what if, what if part of the regulation was a bunch of county extension agents like myself who were experts? I think that's one of the scary things. Most of the time you think of regulation, it's just tasked to do more rules without anything to actually... But what if that regulation included money to have people like myself potentially come out to your sites or consult with you. Um, and I think, you know, I don't want to speak for this entirely, but I don't think I would be here doing my PhD uh, on Phytophthora if it wasn't for all the regulations surrounding Sutton Oak death. Because they do cause people to, you know, they cause things to change, you know, they, they affect things changing. And, and the, a lot of this Cal Phytos working group to some extent grew out of the California Oak Mortality Task Force, maybe I'm not, but this incredible group of people that got together surrounding sudden oak death as a problem and the regulations. And I think perhaps we wouldn't have any Northern California Phytophthora uh, researchers outside of the CDFA if it wasn't for the regulations surrounding sudden oak death. So that's, I mean, they're not always good, but that's maybe one benefit. Just really quick. I don't know if everyone knows this, but nurseries are inspected by local ag commissioners and things like that. And so if something was written into the law, they could just tag that on to their already existing activities. Okay, we're going to have one more question and then or comment, and then I'm going to wrap it up. So let's let Allison say one last thing. Yeah, just on the topic of feelings about regulations, as a land manager, when I think about the threats from the nursery industry to the lands that I manage, it's really commercial nurseries. And, you know, it's a lot of invasive plants coming in and pathogens that this proposed regulation is going to do nothing about. So I sort of feel like it's focusing on the wrong problem or just such a small piece of a much bigger problem. Well, with that positive note, um, so... <laughs> I, I want to say a couple things. Um, 
First, you guys have gotten a little window into some of the issues that the working group has been grappling with for the past couple of years. And I encourage you, if you liked this kind of conversation, to stick around. Um, we did have a meeting that included regulators at our restoration committee um, about six or seven months ago. And they were very receptive to these um, problems and trying to work towards a solution, which is why this white paper is coming about. Um, so with that, I will say again, thank you to all of you for coming out here and to all of our presenters. So thank you everybody for that. Um, I will be sending an online evaluation link out to you. Um, so make sure that if you didn't register through the online survey that I have your email address, just leave a note for me out on the registration desk so you can tell us what worked and what didn't and we can make it better for the next time. If you loved this and you can't wait to do more, there is going to be a nursery tour um, in two weeks, May 31st, here in the South Bay again in Palo Alto, Grassroots Ecology and the local CNPS nursery. So if you want to see on the ground how these practices are being put in place, um, that's also online. For people who are looking for their CEUs, they're on the front table. Um, you have your Scantron and the sheet up there. And there is a little bit of leftover food, so if you didn't quite get enough to eat for lunch, um, please grab a little bit of something. Um, and with that, we're going to take a half an hour break. If you're staking, sticking around for the work group, we'll start again at 2.30. Otherwise, thank you again. <laughs>